abides in him ought to walk in the same way in which he walked. So there it is. How do we possess wisdom? Well, it begins with the knowledge of God through the scriptures that instills in our hearts the fear of the Lord. And that is the beginning of wisdom because we see Jesus and strive to walk after Christ. It's not a burden to us to do this. We actually want this because it is the believer's new desire. Now, if you have your Bibles, we'll look at James this morning. Uh, again, chapter 3, verse 13. We ended on chapter 12, or I'm sorry, verse 12 last week. Uh, we'll pick up here today. Uh, James writes, Who is wise and understanding among you? By his good conduct, let him show his works in the meekness of wisdom. Now, if you think back, again, James giving test of the faith. We've gone over this in the previous weeks, that James is laying out what it is to be a true believer. If you doubt your salvation, if you wonder if you're truly saved, the Scriptures give us tests. I love 2 Corinthians where Paul says, examine yourself to see that you are in the faith. Don't go on what you cognitively think. Don't go on your church attendance. Paul says, examine yourself to make sure you're in the faith. And we must examine ourselves by the Scriptures. So again, James giving us test. If you go back, we don't have time this morning, and read chapter 1 of James, chapter 2. James has test of the faith. And also you can go to 1 John. 1 John is full of these tests of true faith. Now, look at verse 13 again. Who is wise, and remember the wise man is walking after Christ and understanding among you. By his good conduct, let him show his works by meekness of wisdom. Now, James lays out three areas that we can find wisdom. Number one is good conduct. Look back at your verse in verse 13. It says, do you pursue righteousness? That's good conduct. Do we strive for this? Not because we have to, because we want to look more like Jesus. When I was an athlete wrestling, I wanted to be a good athlete. So I would cut junk food out of my diet because I really wanted to tone my body and to get where I would be a good competitor when I got in competition. Now, was I attracted to junk food? Oh, absolutely. I love Twinkies and cakes, and if you give me uh, Oreos and cookie ice cream, that's my weakness. But I would strive to stay away from these things because I knew I wanted something greater. I wanted to be a good competitor when I stepped in the little circle and when I competed on Friday nights. I see the Christian life much in the same way, that we are drawn to sin because we are fallen, we are fleshly people, but more than the sin that tempts us, we want to glorify God. Amen? That's the way to look at the Christian life. It is never to say, well, I want to be a good Christian. I guess I've got to do the things that I don't want to do uh, and now do the thing that, which is glorifying God that I really, really don't want. I want my sin more. No, that, that's quite the opposite. The true believer wants more than anything to glorify God and disdains their sin. And James writes in verse 13, good conduct. This is, do you have a desire to pursue a righteous type of living? Look at verse 13 again. And James says, show this by our works. What activities or endeavors are you involved in? How are you living your life? What do you do in your life? Does what you do and pursue, even your hobbies, glorify God? By our meekness or gentleness. This is a word for gentleness. Are you hungry for power or quick to impose your agenda on others? Or do you humbly seek obedience to the Word of God and to others in gentleness? That's a test for many of us in the church. Do we impose our will on others to get our way or do we pursue everything that we desire in a spirit of meekness and gentleness because we see Christ as the utmost in our life and we are primarily concerned with glorifying Him? Robert Johnstone, a commentator, wrote this, The man of the world desires to be counted as anything except meek. This is because we have taken in Satan's concept of manliness instead of God's. The blueprint for what a man is by God it's not how great a fisherman he is or his muscles size in his body or what a great athlete he was or is. See, these things the world measures as a type of manliness, but God says there's another test that's actually the true test. 
And it is meekness, gentleness. James goes on to tell us the source of false wisdom. Look at verse 14. But if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your heart, do not boast and be false to the truth. Now, this is very, very key. What do we have in our heart? Is it something that pointing to us? Do we want our way over God's way? In Matthew 15, verse 19, it says this, For out of the heart comes evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false witness, and slander. Also in Proverbs chapter 4, verse 23, Keep your heart with all vigilance, for from it flows the springs of life. Your heart, my heart, is your greatest enemy. And that's contrary to what the world will say, isn't it? Follow your heart. Whatever your heart desires, go after it. But the Scriptures say that your heart is your greatest enemy because it is drawn to self. It is drawn to what you want. It is drawn to evil things. It is drawn to the flesh. And the Scriptures warn us, as we see in Proverbs here, keep your heart with all vigilance. That's guard your heart, watch your heart, filter it through the Scriptures because your heart will lead you astray. It's quite contrary to the message that we hear from the world regarding your heart. Your heart is not this beautiful thing. Your heart is fallen. My heart is fallen. That's why we must guard our hearts with everything we have because it will lead us into temptation and more than that, actually breaking the commands of God. Now, James goes on and keeps describing these motivations for the wisdom of the world. Look back at verse 14. But if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your heart, do not boast and be false to the truth. Now look, look with me. We're going to cut this up. The first thing he mentions is bitter jealousy. This is a people that are motivated by what they want again. It directs their life. I knew a man who actually was this way, that anything that somebody else had, his neighbor, his co-worker, he wanted to get that. He had to get it, and whatever it took. And it was amazing that he thought that if I just have this one thing, I'll be happy, I'll be content. And as soon as this man attained whatever he wanted, well, he was off to the next, the next venture because he wanted to live up to what someone else had. Do you have bitter jealousy? That's something overriding the desires of God and the things of God and pointing back to me, my heart. Number two, James writes in verse 14 of selfish ambition. Now, this is a form of extreme jealousy. It's concerned over my agenda rather than God's agenda. And selfish ambition, I want you to hear me. When we have selfish ambition, that is actually to, sit, to place ourselves on the throne of God and remove Him. We may not say it, but that's what it is. The direction of my life, the ambition in my heart. God, I know what you say, but this is what I want. So I'm taking you off the throne and I'm ascending. That's what selfish ambition is. And selfish ambition can also easily seep inside the walls of the church when we begin to adhere to human tradition over the Word of God. What we want, what we think is best rather than what God's Word says. Matthew 15, 3 says this. He answered them, Jesus answered them and said, And why do you break the commandment of God for the sake of your tradition? That's why in the church we must be extremely careful with the wisdom of God that we're not drawn away to our own vices, our own mentality, our own preferences to say, well, listen, I want to do things this way. We're going to neglect what God's Word, but we love you, Jesus. Doesn't quite add up. And Jeremiah says this in verse 24 of chapter 9. But let him who boasts boast this, that he understands and he knows me, that I am the Lord who practices steadfast love, justice, and righteousness in the earth. For in these things I delight, declares the Lord. Now look back at the verse in James in verse 14. James mentions one of these things that are evil, being boastful. But there's one thing that we as believers should boast in, and that is our knowledge of God. So jealousy, selfish ambition, and boasting are forms of satanic, fallen wisdom. Look at verse 15. This is not the wisdom that comes down from above, but is earthly, unspiritual, and demonic. So these things that our, our flesh is drawn to, 
this jealousy, this ambition, this boasting, this is demonic, James says. This is from Satan. But if we truly have a heart from God, then we will be, as Jeremiah said, boasting in our knowledge of the Lord. Now, James moves, moves forward and he gives three characteristics of ungodly wisdom. Three characteristics. We see them in verse 15. The first is false wisdom is earthly. It's earthly. It's limited to the things that are of the material world. It's, co it's concerned with the things that are under the sun, as Solomon would say, rather than beyond the sun. And it's guided by our mind, not our maker. Wisdom of the world is guided by our mind and not our maker. Look again at verse 15. The second characteristic of false wisdom is that it is unspiritual. It's rooted in the physical world. Again, it's saying, I want my ways over God's. God's ways are not quite up to par. They need a little polishing. I'm going to give my best spin on these things. And we begin to drift from the Word of God. Those relying on natural wisdom eventually fall into heresy and eventually can cause trouble for the people of God. Division. Uh, Jude chapter... Well, there's one chapter in Jude. Chapter 1. Verse 19. It is these who cause division, worldly people devoid of the Spirit. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 1.20, Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has God made foolish the wisdom of the world? So if we have worldly wisdom, we will cause division somewhere because it detracts from the Word of God. Very quickly, Worldly wisdom is also demonic. Look back at verse 15. Paul says worldly wisdom is rooted in a demonic ideology. Uh, in 2 Corinthians 11.3, Paul writes, But I am afraid that as the serpent deceived Eve by his cunning, your thoughts will be led astray from a sincere and pure devotion for Christ. Paul goes back to Genesis. Paul goes back to the origination of sin. And says, just as Adam and Eve were led astray by the serpent, I'm afraid, I fear that your thoughts will be led astray from pure devotion to Christ. You see, it only takes a little tweak like it did with Adam and Eve. It only takes a deviation from what God said. Remember what Satan said in the garden. And I'll sum it up by saying this. Basically, the serpent said, did God really say that? Did God really say, don't eat from the tree? He countered them with a question to make them question their theology, their doctrine, their God. And they begin to question things and only tweak a little bit, falling into deep, deep sin. Satan has blinded people with his words rather than God's and led them astray and placed their eyes upon self rather than Christ. We'll get back to James in just a moment. 2 Corinthians eleven thirteen. And again, as I'm going through these verses, uh, I've heard before, Pastor, you sure use a lot of Bible verses. That's why we put many of them on the screen where you don't cramp your fingers. But I want you to see how the Scripture answers its own question. The Scripture defines itself. That's why we go to Scripture and I don't preach through the Bible and just give you my commentation on each verse. Again, the pastor has nothing to say that you should want to hear other than what the Word of God says about itself. Amen? The Scripture attests to itself. In 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 13, For such men are false apostles. This is, again, talking to those with worldly wisdom, pursuing their own ways. Such men are false apostles, deceitful workmen, disguising themselves as the apostles of Christ. So again, this is very interesting. Disguising themselves as apostles of Christ. These are people within the church that Paul's talking about that look like believers, that may even sound a bit like believers. And he goes on from here. And no wonder even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. So it is no surprise if his servants also disguise themselves as servants of righteousness their end will correspond to their deeds. Satan's goal is not to come in wearing a, a big horn on his head with pitchfork, running around scaring everybody. No, Satan's goal is to disguise himself to get believers to deviate just a bit from the Word of God. Just go off just a little bit, go off course 
1912, Captain E.J. Smith, he was a cruise ship captain, uh, decided to deviate just a little bit from what he had learned, what he knew, what was right. Uh, and as far as boat speed, this time it was 15 to 20 knots. If you were somebody who has a boat, this was safe back in this time, the speed of the boat. Well, Captain E.J. Smith decided that he would increase the speed to 22 knots just to see how, how she ran. And this led to Captain E.J. Smith crashing the Titanic into an iceberg because he went over what was prescribed. He lost control because he thought his ways were better than what was actually written down in the manual. And so many times, believers do the exact same thing with the Word of God. We see what's in the Word of God, we read what's in the Word of God, and we say, well, let me tweak it just a bit to see what happens. And every time we end up crashing into a giant theological iceberg, it leads us astray from here. When we think we know better than God, and go outside the bounds of God's Word, the very same thing happens. The result of false wisdom. Look at verse 16 of chapter 3. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there will be disorder in every vile practice. Now, James goes back again to jealousy and ambition as being the root of false wisdom. He says, and where this happens, disorder, chaos will follow in every vile practice. One theologian wrote, false wisdom ignites anger, Bitterness, resentment, lawsuits, divorce, racial and social and economical divisions in our world today. False wisdom also includes a lack of trust, and fellowship, and harmony. These are things that will destroy a people, destroy a nation, destroy a body of Christ. If we don't have the wisdom of God rather than anything else, it's got to be preeminent in our life. James goes in verse 17, the marks of godly wisdom. So we've looked at what false wisdom is, and now godly wisdom is the last portion James goes over this morning. And I want us to pay attention to this, because any time the Scripture says, look, this is how you need to live, I want to know what it says. These are marks of godly wisdom. Verse 17 of chapter 3. But the wisdom from above is first pure. Now, number one, if you're taking notes, godly wisdom is pure. Now, pure means to be free from contamination. This is what was happening in the early church. People were coming into the church, false believers, false teachers, and contaminating the church with their tweaks of Scripture. And many of the believers at this time were led astray because they were faithful to come to the temple they were faithful to come to the weekly worship service, but they were not faithful and diligent in their own personal study of God's Word. They didn't know it themselves, and this was actually the downfall of the Catholic Church and the Reformation that Martin Luther pointed out, that we can know the Word of God, that we don't need a priest to dictate this to us, that we are to be students of the Word and stand firm on it. And James writes in verse 17, Godly wisdom is first pure and from above. Now he's referring to the Beatitudes of Matthew 5. Do, do you see this? In Matthew chapter 5, 8, Matthew writes, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God, the words of Christ. In 1 John chapter 3, verse 3, And everyone thus hopes in him, who hopes in him, purifies himself as he is pure. So again, I want you to keep in mind the context behind this. During this time, false teachers are seeping into the church. And it is not pure wisdom that's happening, that's flourishing. It's actually demonic wisdom because the right doctrine is being, being un, unreliable. It's being contaminated. And this is what the Gnostics did historically. The Gnostics, again, gnosis means knowledge. The Gnostics came into the church during this time, and they would actually tell people, yeah, you have the Scriptures, but we have the hidden knowledge. We have more than the Scriptures say, and they would bend things. False teachers creeping into the church. Listen, that happens today as well. False teachers, as Paul said, those looking like apostles creep into the church with their doctrine and stray away from Scripture. This is why, and this is another sermon for another day, but doctrine matters. I've heard before people say, we don't need that 
doctrine stuff. We, we don't need theology. We just need to love Jesus. Well, to know Jesus, you've got to know doctrine and theology. Otherwise, you don't know which Christ you're talking about. You could be talking about the Mormon Jesus or any other iteration of who Christ the world says He is. You must know doctrine. Doctrine is extremely important. Otherwise, we will be led astray. Number two, look back at the verse in James. Godly wisdom is peaceable. James 3.17, but the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable. Again, James knows his Bible. James knows the words of Christ because you know what's coming to his mind when he writes this? Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. Again, in Matthew 5, 9, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Truly wise people that are wise in Christ do not look for conflict. They look for ways to achieve peace. Now, there are times, just on this note, that we as believers draw lines in the sand. And we do, as Jesus said, bring a, war out, bring a sword out. And that's when that doctrine, that's when the knowledge of Christ is perverted. That's when we're ready uh, to go to battle. But we don't draw lines in the sand over trivial things and human wisdom. But number three, godly wisdom is gentle. Look back at verse 17 in James 3. But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, then gentle. Now again, he's going back to the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5, verse 5. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. You see, James knows the words of Christ. The question we've got to ask every day is, do we? When things come up, when we speak to others, do we adhere to the words of Christ or our own ways? In 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 24, Paul wrote this, And the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, be kind to everyone, be able to teach, patiently enduring evil, correcting his opponents with gentleness. And God may perhaps grant them repentance, leading to a knowledge of the truth. So based on the words of Paul, how do you re react to people who oppose you? Do you stand firm on the truth of God's word with gentleness, or do you treat them as they treat you? Is it an eye for an eye mentality? Well, they were ugly to me, so I'm going to give it back to them. You see, we're called to be a step up as Christ was. And look at verse 25 of 2 Timothy, correcting opponents with gentleness. Those, again, opponents, we can skim over the Bible without thinking of it, those that are opposing us with gentleness. Number four, godly wisdom is open to reason. Look back at verse 17. This is another example of how much meat there is in one verse. Amen? You see, we're just slowly walking through verse 17 of James 3. But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, and then open to reason. This is to say we are not, hear me this morning, we're not led by our emotions when it comes to what we know about Christ. We're not led by our preferences. We're not led by our feelings. We are not led by our traditions. We are led by reason by thinking about what the Bible says. Uh, a saying that's very popular in our world today that makes me cringe every time I hear it uh, is to ever hear a Bible study teacher say to his audience, well, what do you think this verse means to you? Well, it doesn't matter what the verse means to me, does it? It matters what God intended it to mean, amen? That's reasoning through the Scriptures. In Acts chapter 17, verse 2, listen to how the Apostle Paul witnessed. And Paul went in, as was his custom, and on three Sabbath days he reasoned with them from the Scriptures. Christianity is not a belief that begins with your emotions. It begins with your intellect. You see, that's what the world doesn't understand. They may look at believers and say, oh, those people are just ignorant when it's actually they who are the ignorant ones because this Word of God is built on the intellect of man. In fact, if you're not engaging your intellect with the Bible and reasoning with it as the Apostle Paul did, then you're probably not understanding a lot of it. Then you're probably very faithful, but you don't understand much of the Scriptures. The Scriptures demand and command you and I to engage our reason, not our feelings. 
not our emotions. And let me say this, your intellect, your knowledge leads to emotion, amen? But the problem is many people approach Christianity with their emotions, hoping that that will lead to knowledge, and that's not how it works. In fact, those that begin with feelings stay in the kiddie pool of Christianity, never growing in their faith, always making it an emotional appeal. Christianity begins, as the Apostle Paul points out, with reasoning with the Scriptures. James 3.17, again, look back at this verse. Number five, the wisdom full of mercy and good fruits. Godly wisdom is full of mercy and good fruits. Uh, in verse 17 it says, But the wisdom from above is first pure, peaceable, gentle, open to reason, and full of mercy and good fruits. Now this could camp out with us and we could stay here for uh, another two hours. I know you want to do that, don't you? You bring your lunches today? Ready for that? Mercy is withholding a punishment that is deserved. Withholding a punishment that is deserved. Look at your, look at your text. Godly wisdom is full of mercy and good fruits. In Luke chapter 6, verse 35, this will really, really hit us hard. But love your enemies and do good to them and lend to them, expecting nothing in return. So your reward will be great and you will be sons of the Most High, for He is kind to the ungrateful and the wicked. Be merciful even as your Father is merciful. So this is our calling. Good fruits also. He goes on to mention this in James 3.17. Draws your mind back to Paul's words in Galatians 5, doesn't it? Again, James knew his Bible. James knew the words of the apostles. And James knew the Scriptures. In Paul's words in verse 22 of chapter 5 but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. This is what James calls us to. If you want godly wisdom, you're going to possess good fruit in your life. And you're going to possess a peaceful attitude. Number six, godly wisdom is impartial and sincere. Godly wisdom is impartial and sincere. Look back at verse 17. But the wisdom from above is first pure, peaceable, gentle, open to reason, full of mercy and good fruits, impartial and sincere. Now, these words mean unwavering without hypocrisy. Unwavering without hypocrisy. This means that we're confident in the words of God. This means we're confident in what we believe. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, this means that we are confident enough that we can defend our faith when it is challenged, that we are not drawn out of the faith. When we hear a false teacher come in, we are not quickly led astray because our mind goes back to what the Bible says. Amen? Ephesians chapter 4, 14. I love this. Paul wrote, So that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, craftiness, and deceitful schemes. James is saying true wisdom is not led astray. True wisdom in God leads to godly living because we are confident in the words of God. We are unshakable in the doctrine that's been presented because our mind goes back to the Scriptures instead of feelings or emotionalism. Look at verse 18 with me. This is the last verse we'll cover today. And the, and the harvest, a harvest of righteousness, is sown in peace by those who make peace. This is the result of godly wisdom. This is, in verse 18, the result, the fruit, rather, of what is coming from godly wisdom. Godly wisdom produces righteous living, and righteous living is evidence that you know God. You see, we can look at the fruits of others and see if they are a believer or not. It doesn't just go by profession, profession. Anybody, in fact, we, they've done studies. Barna Research has done studies. And Barna says that probably 85% of America says they are Christian. But Matthew chapter 7 says the way is narrow and few will find it. So who's right? Apparently there's something wrong with the numbers there. 
Apparently, there are many people professing Christ, but living a different way, but possessing a different form of wisdom that is not godly wisdom, but is based on their feelings and emotions. The most deadly, damning form of Christianity today is a prosperity form of Christianity that says God deserves, or you deserve rather, the gifts of God rather than anything else, that you're entitled to good things from God. And God never gives anything bad. God never allows any evil to flow from His hands. And the one verse I reference many times, or book rather, is the book of Job. Now, I love talking about the book of Job because Satan didn't just attack and God wasn't in the heavens shaking His head saying, Oh no, He's at it again. We've got to, got to come at Him and fight. There's no battle going on. Satan is a dog on a leash. If you read the book of Job, he had to approach God and ask permission to afflict Job. Amen? God gave permission. Why did He do that? Romans 8, 28, because all things work for good and His glory. See, God's got it worked out. There's no war between God and Satan going on. God has a dog on a leash, and He uses Satan for His own purposes. That's a beautiful picture and so encouraging. James write, writes in verse 18, and a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. Now, we're going to close with this, but some misinterpret what the Scriptures mean when they talk about peace. Shane Rosenthal wrote this, a commentator. The peace that we now have with God is not some kind of peaceful, easy feeling. Through Christ's death and resurrection, we are not objectively, or now rather objectively, with peace at God. So when the Bible talks about peace, it's not talking about you just having a peaceful, easy feeling. It's much more than that. We are at peace with God. In Ephesians, it says that we were once enemies of God, away from the Lord, and He drew us near in Himself. Therefore, the believer who has repented of their sins and believes in Christ now has peace with God. He is not with, at war with God anymore. And this should make worship explode in your hearts, amen, to see that God was once wrathful against us. But now we, as James wrote, are under a treaty of peace with the living God. And listen, that's what we proclaim as believers. That's why we're excited to evangelize. That's why you should, I should be on fire to tell your co-workers, your neighbors, and everyone you encounter about the love of Jesus Christ, not because it's some ethereal, hey, it's going to make you feel so much better if you come to Jesus, but the true message of the gospel to unbelieving sinner, sinner, sinners are, you are under the wrath of God at this time. And there is peace to be had, but you've got to repent of your sins. Turn to Christ. It is a pleading, isn't it? It's not a, listen, God's going to make your life so much better. It is actually something different, that there is forgiveness to be had in the shed blood of Christ. And that is the most beautiful truth that you can ever experience. Amazing grace. How sweet the sound that saved a good person like me. No, a wretch who was under the wrath of God, but no more in terms of peace with Him. That's why grace is so amazing. Amen? And that's what motivates you and I to spread the gospel to our community and the nation. There is no greater calling than to be one of God's royal priests that you are called to this morning. Let's bow our heads and go before the Lord in prayer. Father, what an honor what a calling we have as your children, Lord, to proclaim the gospel to the nations, to live righteously, not as a duty, but because we now desire this, that the sins in our life we see have been holding us, have been a, a prison, as Jesus himself said, and we have been set free to glorify you, the creator and maker of the universe. There is a dying world, Lord, without you that is on the brink of hell. We pray, God, that we are ignited through the Scriptures, that we are those that chase the knowledge of God over the emotions, that, Lord, we want to know you deeper, that we want to get to the bottom of that deep well Romans speaks of, Paul writes of in Romans chapter 3. We thank you so much for Jesus. We thank you for the sacrifice on the cross. We pray these things in his name. Amen.